All right, hello everybody, and welcome to our DCN webinar series. So my name is Johanna Viharvara, and I will be your host for this session. So today we'll talk about the Cisco Tetration platform and hybrid cloud workload protection. And with us, we have from the DCN CU, we have Yoshi Sabagaran, um, product manager, uh, giving the session for us. And then um, he'll be also answering the questions. So maybe those will be answered then more in the end, or we can maybe take something in between the session as well. And again, the audience is muted, so use the Q&A section. I can post the link. I'll post it in the chat section uh, for where these materials will be posted afterwards. So it will be the deck and recording and Q&A. And um, yeah, without further ado, uh, Yoti, whenever you're ready. So I guess we'll have a, first a presentation and then you will also have um, a demo. Hello, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, so welcome to this uh, DCN session on the uh, Cisco Titration platform, hybrid cloud workload protection. So from today's session standpoint, what we will be covering is the security features of uh, Titration platform itself. And uh, we will be covering some of the features that have been already available, but we will be spending time on some of the new features that we announced uh, a month, month and a half ago, uh, from the uh, hybrid cloud workload protection standpoint, um, right? So that is the key intent of this presentation today. And uh, as Johanna pointed out, use your Q&A panel. We will uh, see if we can answer uh, question and answers right away here, or we will take it offline and provide the response to you as well. So there is one more update that we will do as part of the end of this presentation is the uh, consumption or the deployment options for the customers uh, so that is available that we have expanded, right? And there are two more new deployment models that are available. So we will uh, spend some time and we will talk about those as well. So let's get started. So if, if you look at the modern data centers, right? So the key questions that a lot of the customers are the key challenge that a lot of the customers face is how do I build a secure infrastructure for my applications? And the applications, as you know, or the data centers in, a, in an enterprise today is not a single environment anymore. anymore. Uh, customers have on-prem data centers. They have uh, public cloud uh, presence, and in some cases, actually multiple public clouds as well. And you have workloads running across these environments, and uh, for, uh, customers are struggling to secure uh, these workloads um, to provide uh, better uh, infrastructure or for their applications and all that. So from, uh, the, the, if you look at the challenge, there are three aspects actually that drives the complexity of the challenge itself. The first and foremost, many customers don't know what is running in the environment, what applications they have, how these applications are communicating with each other, how they are grouped together, what are the infrastructure services that these applications are consuming, and which ones are communicating to entities that may be in the public cloud. So they have, they don't have this understanding or ability to uh, have this information. That is that the lack of that knowledge is uh, causing a lot of security problems. That's the first. The second aspect, if you look at it, even today, the predominant security design for a data center is perimeter based. So they won't, um, it, it, you have um, security uh, instruments, either firewall and other um, appliances or other models built around the perimeter but once you are inside the data center, you have a free lateral movement. So you can move from different zones, you have uh, any systems can communicate with anything else. That type of model <clears throat> is not, doesn't work anymore as we have seen with all the security incidents that have happened over the last few years. So customers have to get to the uh, segmentation model. It can be micro segmentation, it can be any segmentation. They need to implement segmentation within the data center and uh, uh, using a, a whitelist-based policy so that they can enable a zero-trust model. So that is, that is key. They have to do that, and that is they have to embark on that journey. The third uh, aspect is how do I identify the behavior deviations or identify anomalies and suspicious things much more quickly, much more proactively? And then how do I reduce my attack surfaces by uh, remediating vulnerabilities or known vulnerabilities that may exist in my environment because of certain software packages that I use. 
so that they can keep the inform, uh, infrastructure much more secure, right? So they don't have proper mechanisms to tie these things together in a real-time basis to uh, reduce that attack surface. So these are the three challenges that customers face. So what we will do as we go through this presentation is we will see how titration enables them to address these things and um, enable a much secure infrastructure for the applications. So as you all know, with titration, the first and foremost is we enable customers to understand what's running in the data center using the telemetry that titration collects, right? The packet data that we collect or the packet metadata that we collect uh, from servers as well as from the network infrastructure that enables the platform to understand what is running in the data center, right? And that we bring into the platform analyze it at scale, use the algorithms to correlate things, and all that. So that is key. And as you all know, we collect only information from the header. We don't look collect anything from the payload. And for the security features that you are looking at right now, it is important for servers or for customers to have the software sensors on the servers because the amount of data that we can get and, the, and using that, the information that we can provide is very rich. So it is, um, imp, uh, it is important and the software sensors play a critical role in the security features uh, for the, uh, from, a, uh, for, uh, from an infrastructure standpoint, right? So the visibility and forensics, so that is key. And the other thing is titration, we retain that information for long duration so customers can go back and analyze it and uh, uh, use it for, um, for historical purposes too. The second type of information titration collects is the process data. So at the server level, what are the process that's executed on the server itself, right? So who is running the process? When did it run? And uh, what are the process parameters, including the process binary hash? Basically, this is like a process signature that you compute and then you can use it for various purposes in order to identify, even you can identify if that process has any known bad uh, behavior or not. So you can use the process information, that the process inventory is key. So if a process is executed on the server, titration has information about this. And the other thing the platform does, as you all know, is correlating the process to the traffic. So at any given point in time, titration platform can give information about which traffic was originated and uh, originated on which server and by which process, actually, which process belongs, the traffic belongs to which process on the server. So you can correlate all the way up to the process, and that is that is key for, uh, not only for security, but also for troubleshooting as well. And the third thing that titration does using this information is the application, enable application insight. So as you all know, Titration builds that application dependency map based on this information. So it allows customers to understand how the applications, uh, application components are clustered together, how these application components are communicating with each other, which entity and what are the type of infrastructure services that these, this application or a particular application needs access to and which communication is going through load balancer, which is not, how the users are accessing the application. So basically, titration builds that blueprint for the application. And the analogy that I use with customers is, <clears throat> this blueprint is essential for security. When try uh, creating a security plan for a building without a blueprint. So that is not possible at all, right? So that's the same approach. So you need this blueprint, and this blueprint plays as a fundamental uh, capability in order to build that uh, uh, security functionalities on top, right? And not only that, titration also allows customers to keep this information up to date because all this mapping and everything is derived based on the telemetry data. So they can keep this information up to date as well. So these are, this enables customers as a foundation level to understand what is running. So what do I have in my infrastructure? How these entities are communicating? So that visibility itself is great, which a lot of the customers uh, do not have. So once you have that understanding or once customers have that understanding, now they can start to build the security layers on top. 
application segmentation or <clears throat> you can we call it application segmentation but when you talk to a customer they may have uh, projects around they may call it micro segmentation it doesn't matter what type of segmentation they are using and uh, it is it is critical to enable the segmentation using whitelist policy because as you know there are a number of uh, entities actually NSA as well as um, Australian uh, defense uh, side also so there are the primary security advice they give as you need to enable a whitelist based approach within the data center to build a secure infrastructure so that is foundation there is no question about that you can uh, you you will have access to the slide deck so you can look at these links and this this go these go back to 2016 2015 so this is not the concept itself is not new and even from customer standpoint they have been embarking on this micro segmentation journey over the years but when you talk to them you will find out that how little progress they have made the reason is because nobody knows what that whitelist policy should be for the application and uh, <clears throat> customers even today struggle to even if they have a whitelist version of a whitelist policy they struggle to keep that whitelist policy up to date uh, as the application behavior changes so it is important for customers to understand that um, uh, that whitelisting is key and segmentation is critical and that with iteration actually we can really enable them on the journey because we titration actually uh, um, <clears throat> allows them to auto generate the whitelist policy based on the blueprint so that that's that's the key factor here so with the iteration platform we have addressed the policy aspect in a very comprehensive way as you all know and uh, the using the uh, blueprint of the applications that are generated titration gives the recommendation of the whitelist policy and the whitelist policy will say for this application to work these are all the only communication that you need to allow with a series of allows and with a default deny in the end and now as a customer i have that whitelist policy as an application administrator or a security team whoever is doing the segmentation i know where to start with and when custom and in addition to that actually with the tration it also gives the capability to bring in other corporate level policies and tie it into their whitelist policy using hierarchical model some of these things we will see in the demo how how it can be done so if a security team has a higher level policies around compliance related applications and this this always happens um, right and customers when they have certain set of applications where it has to be governed by a certain default rules and it can be whitelist or it can be black blacklist so those can be inherited into that whitelist policy that titration generates and it will seamlessly merge it together so the administrators don't have to trust that whitelist policy blindly they can take that whitelist policy and they can do a policy simulation on the platform so they can really test the policy in order to uh, see what traffic will be allowed what will be dropped if that policy is enforced so we will come to the enforcement mechanism what are the different enforcement mechanisms customers can uh, embark on and how it is um, important so but even before they enforce it they can test the policy and when they perform that what if analysis of the policy they can use historical data they can select two weeks of data two months of data depending on the telemetry how long they have been uh, they have the platform running they can select the data and then they can run the simulation and they can feel confident that when i enforce this policy i will not be breaking my application there is one more actually construct that we do allow and which i will show if customers wants to start with a less restrictive option little less restrictive option and still track policy deviations they can change the catch all deny the default deny to catch all allow not block it in the beginning but still start recording the events so um, if the application starts to communicate outside of the policy anything that hits the catch all policy from titration standpoint is a policy violation so that is also possible so customers can 
we provide that flexibility so customers can implement that whitelist based model in a safe and uh, with a much more confident in a much more confident way right so that is that is a second aspect actually that iteration brings in the communication control using whitelisting and once you have um, the policy right and this is this is how we generate the policy and you all know that actually you, have, you might have seen this too it generates the application dependency maps and the blueprints and the workspaces and then you get the, the outcome as the policy and you can use um, the, the software sensors and other different mechanisms in order to collect the telemetry for this purpose and then um, use it right so I'm not going to spend much time on this slide uh, we will we'll go into the enforcement so once the policy is available the policy is there customers can then users can then choose to enforce that policy and who has the enforcement capability can be governed through the role based access control that iteration provides and when customers want to use the iteration enforcement capability then the policy is directly programmed on the operating system itself basically the policy is pushed to the server's operating system and we use operating system constructs like ip tables in the case of linux and windows advanced firewall in the case of windows servers in order to enforce the policy so that the policy is enforced right on the workload close to the application and when that and uh, when when you have that mechanism basically a workload based uh, enforcement approach then customers can realize segmentation irrespective of the infrastructure type they may have workloads running in on prem doesn't matter what network infrastructure they have and they may have workloads running in public cloud as well so uh, seamlessly across all this uh, environment actually they can have a consistent policy enforcement not only that they can also realize this enforcement across bare metal virtualized infrastructure as well as containers so this is the key piece right so <clears throat> today i might be running a certain component of an application in a virtual machine and one month later i might move it to a container i may contain containerize it and still i want to have the same policy mechanism i don't want to be looking at a different model for policy enforcement that is one of the key differentiation factor for titration is yes, they don't with very minimal overhead on the workloads and um, irrespective of the infrastructure type basically we provide a policy enforcement capability and this, thereby enabling segmentation and the segmentation basically contains a lateral movement that is key so even if they have a security incident that may come in nobody can prevent the incident incidents will happen but the key thing is how quickly can you contain it how quickly can you identify it and how can you reduce your exposure so that those are the things that you can do from a data center standpoint so with the segmentation basically you are containing the lateral movement so even if something happens then you exactly know what it would communicate to what is the scope going to be and then you can take necessary actions so this is this is that's why it is key to have the segmentation so you don't have the free lateral movement anymore you can you can contain the lateral movement and then you can secure the infrastructure better so once the um, policy is in place or policy is enforced and iteration continuously tracks for policy compliance so if any of the application components deviate from the policy then titration can identify those policy deviations in almost near real time and then uh, send an alerts on it so these alerts can be integrated into customers security incident and event management systems so they may use splunk for this matter they may use ibm curator or they may use other systems as a sim system um, so titration can send those alerts to those platform so they can take they know about it proactively and then they can look into it and if it is a legitimate deviation they can take actions then and there right so it's it's very important 
and they can whitelist it, they can update the whitelist policy, enforce the white updated whitelist, all that can be done using the titration platform itself. So there is one more construct actually which titration provides, which is called as annotations or asset tagging. So with this actually what titration provides is the ability to bring in attributes that define or that identify the workloads like a server, what does it mean in a customer environment? It can be server A, it may be a VM, it may be in a production VM, maybe running a database, it is in this location, it may be used for certain application or a compliance related application. So what that construct is for a server, what, what it means in the business uh, context. So customers can bring in those attributes into titration. And most importantly, these attributes can be automatically brought in into titration by using VMware vCenter integration, for example. If customers are using vCenter VM attributes that are available in vCenter or AWS tags, so titration can automatically query those and keep that tags also up to date because we do that periodic sync in order to keep this information. And in the case of containers, for example, the same information comes from the Kubernetes or OpenShift. So that tags basically uh, allows customers to abstract that policy information. So they don't have to use IP or those type of in, uh, ephemeral in, uh, attributes anymore. Rather, they can use these higher level metadata and the IPs can change underneath it, but policy will be automatically up to date, right? Kept up to date by titration platform. For example, I may define a certain policy for my production workloads with compliance tags. Today, there may be 100 VMs that match that compliance related aspects, and tomorrow I may spin up 10 more VMs, actually, that will meet the same criteria, and those 10 VMs will also inherit the same policy. And you can, this elasticity is the, the automatic policy update based on this elasticity is something different, unique. Nobody else has this in the market today, right? And uh, this completely eliminates for customers to understand the IP, uh, they, don't have to understand, they don't have to know the IP constructs. And titration in the back end normalizes, identifies, converts this into the network constructs and then enforce the policy. Right, so this is um, a lot of customers like this model. They use actually these. This information can also come from CMDB, for example. If a customer has a CMDB and they want to feed this information from those systems, they can feed that uh, from that too. So the policies can be defined using the higher level entities, and you will also see how we tie these to different new security functionalities like vulnerabilities in, in, um, as we go through this presentation. So once the policy is there, as we said, titration, uh, with the titration enforcement, we can enforce the policy directly on the workloads. But customers can also consume the policy to enforce it using other mechanisms. That is, uh, for example, with, from titration, we do publish the policy using our Kafka interface. So customers may say, we do, uh, I want titration to maintain that policy but I want to enforce the policy using another mechanism. Uh, for example, I even NSX, right? I want to take this policy into NSX. Or I have other uh, mechanisms. For example, I may have ACI. In the case of ACI, basically the policy uh, enforcement, you, you have to consume the policy. You have to uh, basically uh, convert this into a coarse grain policy so that you can um, meet that hardware constructs and then enforce it into the ACI fabric too. Or I want to convert this into a firewall rule and then I want to enforce it to the firewall. So customers can consume the policy in a multiple different way in order to enforce this and thereby actually they can have a, the same policy being orchestrated across the infrastructure. So the, the whatever gets orchestrated in the workloads by titration is highly granular. So we whitelist every east-west traffic. It can be VM to VM. It can be even, for example, uh, in, the, in the case of containers, it is even uh, critical to enforce it at the container host uh, because a lot of the traffic may not even leave the host 
how do you control in that manner in the in that sense right so you need to control that so uh that is highly granular and you um the same policy can be consumed by other entities but you don't need the same level of granularity at the other layers of enforcement because you may not see all the traffic there for example at the firewall level if it is at the perimeter you are predominantly what you are going to see is the uh, the the north south traffic so you can extract only that north south traffic and then orchestrate it as a firewall rule and you can take the same policy in the case of aci you have the fabric based enforcement but again uh, the tcam and everything plays into comes into play so you need to be aware of that so we have a a, a, a prototype app actually that will show what the tcam utilization is for that policy which leaves will be uh, uh, the policy will be enforced on which leaves how many tcam entries it is going to consume and it also that app also gives the ability to adjust the policies what where you want to generalize it where you want to keep that uh, granular enforcement and then you can you can do that and then you can have the fabric level enforcement too so thereby actually you have a multi layer security within the infrastructure so you are moving away from the single layer and security model or the only the perimeter to a much more secure multi layer uh, model which is critical for the customers and the main thing is with iteration if the policy changes iteration publishes that updated policy over the same notification interface so um, users or the systems doesn't have to constantly keep on pulling so that mechanism is also available so now that the key thing is we have done the segmentation a lot of the customers when you talk to them and in even in some cases some of the competitors they think that just the segmentation al alone will provide a secure infrastructure for the data center that is not the case segmentation is only one dimension of the security one aspect of the security right so you have contained the communication you have done that and in a lot of the cases actually if you look at it if there is a security incident the network communication or the um, the ability to move trying to move laterally or trying to take the data out happens in the later phases of the attack in the initial phases actually you will see different set of behaviors within the workload and these may be like for example changes in the behavior of the process what a process has been doing before and what it is doing now for example if you take wanna cry uh, that is a, that is a classic example where it did a privilege escalation of the known process running on a server which is the windows smb process and then taking um, through doing a privilege escalation through that and then uh, doing bunch of things before even communicating to the other network layer so you will network c containing the lateral movement is one angle but you need to look at other things so that's where with iteration uh, that's why what we say is the holistic workload protection because we look at other behavior deviations on the process, on the on the workload itself on the service itself so we, let's start with the process so everything if you look at it in the on the workload is what a workload does is governed by the process what process is running on the server and then um, so with the iteration we what we saw before was we identify we have an accurate inventory of the process that's running on the server but that's not sufficient you need to then monitor the process for behavior changes what is that process doing and what is it, it what it is doing is it normal or is it suspicious if it is suspicious how can i tie these things together and say what exactly it did and how can i notify it proactively no notify somebody proactively so that you can you can gain more insight into it can take action to contain it and quarantine it if needed right so that is that is the key thing and with the iteration that is where we are what we are doing with the new features of the software so what we are doing if you look at it as based on the process information that we collect um, from the servers with iteration we try to identify those behavior deviation right and we compare that behavior deviations to the execution patterns of the malware itself 
So what are the chain of events? For example, we are seeing, are we seeing a privilege escalation followed by side channel attacks or um, shell code execution or a random specific file access patterns? Or even we track the user logon uh, act, um, trails, right? Or, audit um, activities around that, meaning which users are trying to log into the servers. So we track that too. So it is important to track those behavior changes and then providing the flexibility to chain these things together and then define those event types. So let's start, let's look at it in more detail. So based on the process information that we collect, titration collects, it also um, gives you that process tree lineage, how the process was initiated. If it is a kernel process, actually you will see a different um, thread or a different process lineage. And if it is a user executed process, you will see a slightly different uh, lineage, but you can track all the way to the end to see how the process was initiated. And if it was started by a user, by logging into the shell, you will see those trail as well. So you have the full snapshot, and it is a time series view of the snapshot. So from the time the server booted up to until now, what were the process executed and in the order in which it was executed. And if a new process is executed, we have a trail of it and it joins the same process tree, right? And <clears throat> so you have the full, um, so the users have the full view of it. And using this, then we start to track the behavior deviations. So if a process is trying to do a privilege escalation, are we seeing shell code execution? Are we seeing side channel attacks? Side channel attacks are the ones where <clears throat> a process tries to access a memory or even uh, the, the cache on the CPU in, without proper authorization. So you will start to see operating system signals around that. And a titration actually sensor picks up those signals from the operating system and uh, it then correlates and it sends to the platform where it is all correlated to see what that behavior is. And using this behavior deviations, today we can even identify specter and meltdown. That is critical. So customers need to know if a specter type of incident is happening in my machine. And this, these type of incidents, if you look at specter and meltdown, these cache access and all these things happen first, even before the network communication happen. So the, this, these behavior changes will give customers the early indications of the compromise, right? what they need to be looking into. And most importantly, with the iteration, we provide the capability for customers to define events around it. There are certain out-of-the-box events, but uh, customers can chain these things together for, they, let's say, for a compliance environment where they have highly sensitive databases. They can create a separate event thread for that. They can say, if I see privilege escalation followed by access to these directories, then I need a critical alert on it. Or they can even put an alert just for the file access. If I see these set of files being accessed on the workloads by anything outside of a specific process. For example, if it is a database process and they have database threads that are running in there and only those should access the files and nothing else, and if they want to make sure nothing else touches the file, and if anything else, then they want an alert on it, they can do that. So they can set up alerts based on the file access patterns as well, and then receive notifications on it. They can say whether they want a notification alert or they want to just iteration to record the incident and they can get those events. So there are a number of these, or let's say another example, another classic example is uh, the uh, compromised user. So some of, sometimes actually what happens, there is a compromised user account and uh, that could be exploited within the data center for getting, gaining access. And if you have an information about that and you want to immediately set up alerts for it, you can do it. You can set up an alert and say, if I see this user ID being used to log into any of the servers, I want an immediate alert on it. So <clears throat> you can set up alerts on those user logons too. 
So with this process behavior, basically we identify multiple sets of these events and we, ch we allow customers to chain these things together. And then um, making, and then link it to the behavior patterns of the malware and then identify those events. Again, this is another dimension of the security, right? So this is, in addition to the lateral movement, now you are even being more proactive. So that is, um, which is good. And <clears throat> is that sufficient? I have done these two. I have contained the lateral movement. I now identify the behavior deviations and all that. Is that sufficient? No, it is not. You have another thing you need to do as well. You need to, first of all, make sure you are, um, the software releases or the software versions that are running on the servers don't have any higher critical vulnerabilities in your environment. So that is important. So if you, there, is a, there are interesting statistics behind it. So if you, if you look at it, all the attacks that have, done, that have happened so far have leveraged a known vulnerability that has been there for six months or more without being patched in the environment. So patching and keeping the, inform or the, the versions up to date is critical, but not all, a lot of the customers don't do that because they don't have the information about how these things are related together. From an application standpoint, how critical, how exposed is my workload for this vulnerability? Is it really critical for my environment or it is not? So they need to know about it. So that's, the, <clears throat> you take WannaCry, it exploited a known vulnerability with SMB process. You take Equifax hack, it um, exploited the Apache struts vulnerability, uh, which is the most critical, which has a critical score of 10, right? the highest vulnerability score you can possibly have. Spectre and Meltdown, it's just a matter of time, basically, uh, to have, um, uh, and if the customers are not patched and have these CVEs, they, they, they need to think about it. It has not been exploited so far, but as you know, things will happen, right? So it is important. And what Gartner predicts is by 2020, 99% of the vulnerabilities exploited will continue to be in known ones. And there is another statistics that is also there. By <clears throat> eliminating the vulnerabilities associated with the software, basically, uh, customers can reduce their attack surface by 85%. Just by, imagine that, if a customer has set of servers and they know what vulnerabilities are there and they keep it up to date, then they reduce their attack surface by 85%. So that is, the, that's the kind of impact the vulnerability things and these things have. So the reason is because all the time the attackers are looking for some way to get in, exploit something to gain more access, and then to take the data out. So it is important to keep this um, information up to date. So what we do, what, what do we do in titration to enable customers to seamlessly track these vulnerabilities and uh, address it? So first of all, titration tracks all the software packages that are installed on the server. That is critical difference here that we take an inside out approach, meaning the software sensors are running on the workload. It is monitoring the activity on the workload in real time and then communicating this information to the platform. So if somebody installs the software, uh, installs a package on the server, they don't even run it, but they uh, uninstall it after a couple of hours, we will still have a trail of it. So that is important. So we baseline or we identify all the software packages that are installed on the server. What version is running, who's the distributor, all that information is available. And then Titration takes that information and then compares that to the known CVE database. So CVE is the common vulnerability and exposures database. So if you can go to NIST or you can go to MITRE. So these are the, the uh, basically the third parties that provide that database, known vulnerability database from different sources, provide that information. In the titration platform, 
in the current release, we have included 19 years worth of CBE information and going all the way back to 1999. So if a customer is running a software that is, even if it may be older version, and if it has a CVE, we will flag it. So once the CVE is there, once the CVE, customers can use and tie these vulnerabilities to the policy. So that is another thing. We will see that in a couple of slides. To quarantine, to restrict communication, all that. It can be based on the vulnerability or the vulnerability score. So the important thing with the CVE is for every vulnerability, it gives a score. The score can be from 1 to 10, 1 being low, meaning you really don't, may not have to worry about it. Anything between 1 and 3 is low. 3 to 5 is about medium, so you can, and uh, 6, 6 and 7 are considered uh, high. 8 through 10 is critical. So anything more than up 8, basically, customers have to think about patching it as soon as they get a fix for it. So the vulnerability score will also be shown in the titration UI. You can, you will see all that in the demo, and uh, customers can take action based on that. So if you look at the CV um, information, right, so with we identify all the software packages that are installed there, and then um, it gives the information about what the CV is, and um, you can click on it, you can get information about it, what, uh, how high it is, and um, uh, how it can be exploited, all that information, and then you can take action. So, and not only that, actually, administrators can quickly find out all the servers in the inventory that has the same vulnerability. They can search based on the vulnerability ID, or they can search based on the package version, or they can base on the score, uh, search based on the score. And then they can get immediately the list of servers that has the same vulnerability, and then they can put a patching plan in place in order to, um, in order to then uh, remediate uh, that uh, vulnerability. So once that vulnerability is there, then users can define policies based on that. They can say if it can be one or more vulnerabilities, and if I have this vulnerability, I want to restrict communication through the policy. I can say I want to deny all communication to this host or and allow only these set of communication so I can just patch it. So you can quarantine the server or you can say this web-facing workload has a critical vulnerability. I cannot allow it to talk outside for now. I'm going to restrict the communication. Or um, the database server, I have a critical vulnerability here. I have to put a patching plan in place, otherwise I'm quarantining it. So you can take actions based on concrete actions uh, based on this. And uh, the most important thing is if you have, um, if you have, uh, just because it's defined based on the vulnerability score, today you might have five or 10 or even 100 machines that match that vulnerability, but if somebody installs the same version of the package with the vulnerability on a new server and it matches the vulnerability, it will be automatically included into that policy rule. So, and if somebody patches it and it no longer has the vulnerability, it will be removed from that policy set and an appropriate policy based on the application will be pushed to it. So, Tetration has those automations built in to the platform so that these type of actions doesn't need any manual intervention. So that is a critical difference uh, with any other system. And the other thing is actually we all the, we tie all these three dimensions together from a workload perspective. That is another key difference. And when, when we talk to analysts or when we talk to that, they, they immediately get that difference. You, we do it in such a comprehensive fashion that um, most of the vendors tie it in either a single dimension or one of these they can do, but they can't do this comprehensive uh, thing. So that is one of the key aspects. So with that, actually, let me go to the demo, and then we will come back to the – I'll just cover the new features from a demo standpoint and then so that you can take a look at it, and then we will come to the consumption model because I want to spend, I want to spend about five minutes talking about the updated consumption model, and that is uh, critical. So I will see if there are any, yeah, I see about 10, 11 questions here. Uh, 
Okay, so I have important question about containers. So does it work, does this work even with container endpoints, not just VM endpoints? I would assume uh, you are referring to some of the vulnerabilities and the process related events that you are uh, talking about. Um, so we do, this does work with the containers as well. The main, in the current release, we do identify all the packages that are installed on the container host. But there is a subtle difference today. We need to do enhancements here as we improve on the contain, uh, container capability. The main thing is we don't, today we don't baseline the packages that a container pod brings in. So whatever is there in the host actually is discovered, we track vulnerability for that, right? But the, the, there will be extensions of software um, enhancements to support the pod uh, thing as well. So with, if somebody, some, some software component comes as part of the pod, we don't track that today in the containers, but uh, that will be done. In the VMs, yes, bare metals, yes, absolutely, right? So let, let, since we are on the vulnerabilities topic, why don't we start from there? So in the server, um, if, if you are looking at a server profile uh, here, you will see a tab called packages, and this will show all the software packages that are installed on the server. And if you look at it, and I can even search by the name. I can say his name contains. For example, I'm going to, this is a server actually where we have installed the same version of the Apache struts that was used in the Equifax exploit. And to be precise, actually, this is the CVE that was exploited in the uh, Equifax. You can, as you can see, we give the score right here for them to know and for the user to know, and they can click on it to get the full details of this, how this can be exploited and all that. And uh, um, <clears throat> We have the version information, what is the architecture, who is the publisher. So we have all that data that is available. Now you can take the same CVE, and then you can go here and you can do a full inventory search. I can, I can say, show me all the servers containing the same CVE. Right? So I'm searching for all the servers that has the same CVE. Now I have a concrete list of servers that I need to patch um, in order to remediate from that CVE. I can even search by kind of score. I can even say, show me CVE score, right? I can even, uh, uh, based on the C CVE score, you can uh, search also. So you can do all that. And you can, you have the concrete list. You can even create filters based on this uh, CVE IDs. For example, if I go here, so we do have that. So, for example, we have created a filter here. And you can say, I, I am interested in the CV only for a certain application or certain scope or everything in my data, data center. So you can pick and choose which environment it is ap applicable to, and then you can create it, uh, create it as well. So you can create these filters. And the most important thing is actually you can use this within the policy. So I can say if I have any server that meets this uh, this CVE, right? Then I want to deny all communication and then allow only these communications for patching purposes and probably communication to situation to track this host. But I want to block everything else. So there are four machines actually that are four servers that meet that criteria today, and that will inherit this policy. And if, for example, tomorrow there is somebody installs the same struts version in, in a fifth machine, and it will also take um, become part of this policy automatically. You no know, manual intervention is needed. Or somebody patches the struts, so this uh, this um, CVE is no longer applicable. Then automatically this will be removed from the uh, membership, and appropriate policy will be pushed to it. So you can tie the CVE to the policy. So this is the, the, this is the key thing, and this can be done via API. This can be done via uh, um, via you predefined policies too. So InfoSec can even predefine these policies. They can say if any machine has a vulnerability score of 10 or 9, I am going to by default quarantine it, no matter what it is doing. I'm going to quarantine it. So they can have, even have a default policy like that. So that's the powerful aspect here. So now that we have the CVE thing, now we can also track the, pol uh, the um, t 
track the, the policy or the process aspect of it. For example, let's uh, go to the service here. Let's look at the process snapshot. So the new enhancements that we have done is you will see another tab within the host profile, which is the process snapshot. So the process snapshot uh, basically shows the entire process. I can play this in the order, so it will show all the process that were started in the order from the time the server was booted. And whatever you see here, these are all the kernel threads that were executed on the uh, server. And uh, these are all the user-initiated processes or the system started process after it was uh, booted. And you can do the full, uh, uh, full uh, hierarchy to it. You can, you can build this tree. Of course, you can also get another view where you can start to track in a tabular fashion what are the process, what is the process in uh, details, process parameters, and all that information here. And using this baseline, inventory baseline, titration starts to track the deviations, uh, right? So, uh, for example, if a process, in this case, actually, it is a shell code execution, so you can see since the shell code execution started, what are all the things that it started to do? So you have the full information about this. I can click on it. I can get uh, the, the details about it. I can even replay it in a, in a time fashion to see what exactly happened in that, uh, in, in that scenario, and I can get the full details of it. Most importantly, all this can be sent as alerts. So users don't have to constantly be looking at this uh, information all the time. All they, they can receive this in the form of alerts. So if you, if you look here, you can see uh, the, the full process details, why it is and what it is, and I can, you can even play this information in the order it started to execute the things from uh, the, the time uh, this event happened and we track all that, and when you have the alerts capability, you can go to the forensics config, and you can start to set up alerts. So you, you will see some of the things that are already there, but for example, I can even either create a new one or edit a new, edit an existing one, and I can say, if I see a privilege escalation followed by file access, and if it starts to access, let's say, password file. If I see some process doing a privilege escalation and then accessing a password file, that is a red flag for me. And I want to send alerts on it. So as you can see, you can set up alerts or you can chain all these different types of events together. You can track um, file, file access file name, you can track the process command line, you can track the execution path, you can track even the user that was used to log in and other actions like uh, shell code, privilege escalation, you can track all those things together. You can say, if I see a privilege escalation followed by site channel attack, site channel attack is a meltdown, or site channel attack uh, specter, I can start to, I want an alert on it. So you can define these events together. So the site channel um, is, for example, sources meltdown. So you can, you can, create alerts on all these different type of things. As I said, including you can even track the user logon, usernames. Or if I start to see login failures on these machines, these set of machines, I want a critical alert because somebody is trying to access in a random fashion, probably. So I want to further deviate it. So these are kind of the things that you can proactively detect and identify. And if you want to tie the process to the policy, you can do that too via the API. So if I find out something anomalous and I want to push a policy, I can update the policy via the API and then take um, restrictive actions as well. So you have all that capability today uh, using um, the titration platform. These are some of the new capabilities that are there. With that, let me go back to the slide because I want to spend some time on the new consumption models. Uh, new deployment options that are there. So as you are all aware, right, so basically uh, we, on the on-premise side, of course, we had the large form factor, the small form factor M. We had the Amazon AWS version. In the virtual appliance, one of the key things that we have done in the new release is we have given a software-only option, a ESXi-based virtual appliance that customers can deploy on their own 
hardware. The virtual, um, the system specifications are available in the data sheet, and you can also look at it in the deployment guides. Actually, we published the virtual, virtual appliance deployment guide, which has a procedure how you can deploy titration in this environment. So this is another consumption model that we have added, the software only, so customers don't have to purchase a hardware appliance model, uh, model. They can start with the software only option. It is suitable for smaller environment commercial customers where um, they have less than 1,000 servers. They can use software sensors. They can use ER span sensors in order to collect the telemetry with the software only, and then they can stream the telemetry, and then, uh, they, of course, the iteration platform runs in a ESXi-based environment. So that is one option that we announce. The other option is titration software as a service option. So this is another critical consumption model that is important for customer. So if a customer wants to get started and they don't want to deploy anything in any titration component or run a titration platform in their environment, they can use software as a service option. All they need to do is deploy the software sensors we will onboard them. They, they will be hosted on a titration platform that's fully managed and operated by Cisco. And it is suitable for customers, smaller customers who are ready to stream the data, who are customers who are SaaS only um, and who consume all service, all software as service. And it gives a flexible pricing model. It can, uh, customers can start subscribing to it with as low as 100 workloads. Uh, right, so 100 workload license, minimum term is one year. They can subscribe to it, and they can land and expand. So they can start with 100, let's say, for after three months, they see a real value in it, and they want to expand to 500 or 1,000 servers, they can expand. Actually, with the software as a service today, we can scale, for each customer, we can scale up to 25,000 servers. So it's even suitable for large environments, where customers, if they want to consume software as a service, they are free to sign up here. So onboarding is very quick, and the customers can also realize the benefits of the platform very quickly. So these two models basically removes any remaining barrier to consumption of titration. So customers have a wide range of deployment options to choose from. And um, they can, if they are not ready to use software as a service, they can use a software-only option if they want to even start something to see the value, they can sign up for software as a service as long as they are ready to send the telemetry, right? So it's very quick. <clears throat> so today we have one year and three year terms uh, available for the customers so they can sign up and they can uh, start benefiting from these two consumption models. So with that, I know we are at the top of the hour. So um, let me pause here and uh, of course you know how to reach to um, get to us, we have the entire PSS team supporting us as well. So you can reach out to them, or you can reach out to us when you have questions. If you need any help, um, feel free to reach out to us, and we are here. That, um, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Pete. I guess you can quickly just check if there's some question that you see is really important. Um, okay. We are at the top of the hour. I don't think we can answer all of these, but I'll, I'll send... These will be posted, the questions will be posted on the CCN website as well. So the ones we don't cover now, um, you will receive, I mean, you can go back and check. Um, I'll have Yoti give an answer to these afterwards. But if there's some Yoti now you want to just quickly answer, if you see one of them would be very relevant. Um, okay, I'm looking at the, the software sensor needs to run on ESXA host as well. Yeah. Actually, that is one in interesting question. So are all the uh, the software sensor that is used for all the security features is the same software sensor that runs inside the VM. There is no need for uh, customers to run anything in the hypervisor. That is one of the key advantages with the iteration because we um, provide a hypervisor agnostic approach and even a cloud agnostic approach by running at the operating system level in the guest OS. So all, for all the functionalities that you saw is the same software sensor that runs at the guest OS and still at the same threshold, right? At the 3%, within the same 3% threshold that um, we do all this function, all these functionalities. So 
they don't have to run anything in the hypervisor. Uh, there are a few more questions that are coming in. Let's um, let's take a note of these questions, Johanna, and then you can yeah. send it to me and Tim. We yeah. will answer these questions, and then we will give you the response as well, so you can post the question and the response with it. Yeah, I mean, I'll, uh, yeah, it will. Yeah, I can. Uh, the file can be saved, so we'll yeah. have these posted with the recording and deck. So you can take this. It's in the chat. There's the link where you can find all these materials. So give it a day or two. Um, okay, but oh, great. Um, thank you Yo, so much for uh, presenting today and for our audience. So actually, this concludes our Q3 webinar series. So stay tuned. Uh, we'll soon um, send an email out uh, with the Q4 uh, program and schedule. So thank you all and wish you all a good rest of the day. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone.